It's the best instrument that you want to get into if you think that they're going to print money forever, which they are. It has something like a 25x sensitivity to the change in global M2 money supply. So if global M2 is rising at a pace of like 5%, like it is now, Bitcoin appreciates by 125%. Joe Consorti, known for his work at the Bitcoin layer, focuses on how Bitcoin is reshaping global finance, particularly through his analyses on monetary policies. He's now the head of growth at Thea, a solution to secure your Bitcoin with modular multi-sig and making it easy for everyone to self-custody. If you are mostly a Bitcoin holder, adding a little bit of microstrategy in there can help you juice uh, your returns. For a while, microstrategy was serving as the de facto Bitcoin ETF when there wasn't one here stateside. More companies are jumping on board, and I tend to think that it's going to be one of the most, if not the most popular trends in corporate finance over the next decade, given what we're seeing now, particularly when Bitcoin enters its bull market and the mania from retail investors comes onto the scene you're probably going to see a big surge in companies adopting the MicroStrategy playbook because over a four-year period, they've been able to almost 20x their stock price. Mr. Joe Consorti, thank you so much for joining me today and being a playable character in a sea of non-playable characters. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, man. So we were just, you know, talking offline amid the technical difficulties of, of, of life. We live in the planned obsolescence, uh, things of that nature. I mean, we got we got Bitcoin. You know, we were talking about Bitcoin price. You had to tweet uh, just uh, earlier just talking about, you know, we're in the same same price range uh, as we were a couple of years ago. And obviously that's something that, you know, humans, we just have a hard time dealing with and wrapping our heads around. Uh, what do you make of just, you know, kind of the landscape we're in, the macro landscape? It feels like we're that's that spring that's kind of pushed down and ready to explode. What say, what say Joe? Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, the last time Bitcoin was above one trillion market cap, we only stayed there for about like five months cumulatively, uh, obviously from something like uh, mid-March to May of 20, mid-May of 2021. So you got three months there. And then, uh, you know, that that final kind of breath in October to uh, November. And so cumulatively, we've only been above Bitcoin's market cap prior to where we are prior to this cycle for about five months. You compare that to today, and we've held above uh, $1 trillion market cap for almost 10 months now. Uh, excuse me, almost eight months. And so that's already in and of itself a really welcome development. Um, you know, Bitcoin's price during 2020, 2021, 2022, obviously you had the, the entire cycle. The, the story was FTX. And then the grand resolution of the, of the cycle when we finally bottomed out was the flushing of all of those really bad players. And we kind of chopped around and had to find our base a little bit more. There were no real catalysts because the Fed was still on hold. Other risk markets were, were doing quite well. Um, and then Bitcoin finally woke up and now it's above $1 trillion market cap and it's been there for the last eight months. And so the longer Bitcoin stays above a $1 trillion market cap, the more cemented it becomes as a real player in global finance. Um, you know, you, we talk about things like gold and the S&P 500. S&P 500 is sitting at like over $40 trillion in market cap right now. I think like $45 trillion market cap. Gold sitting at like 12, 13, 14, $15 trillion market cap. The longer that Bitcoin stays above this uh, psychological milestone of $1 trillion, I think the more official it becomes in the, in the eyes of um, you know, TradFi and these investors who've been playing in markets for several decades. So it's all good. Uh, even though it, the, the dollar price is not where we want it to be, and on an inflation adjusted basis, you know, we, we still have not really broken all time highs. Um, the, the longer it stays above $1 trillion nominally, I am happy. Um, and really the last uh, seven months of price action since we did hit that all time high in March has been very constructive. You know, Brandon, you've been in the market for ages. Um, you know, you've been seeing Bitcoin for a very long time. The longer it spends in these zones, the more coins move from those flighty bull market participants who are buying just for the sake of getting in while the price is going up to people who are holding it for its value in the long run. And that builds a stronger base for the remainder of this cycle uh, and for future cycles to come. It, it builds out a base for Bitcoin's price to move higher in this cycle. Then also it, it serves as a floor that people are willing to get back in and bid up the market in future cycles. And so it's all good stuff. It's, it's certainly not what a lot of people would like to see, but I think just zooming out and appreciating that we've been at or around or above $60,000 Bitcoin for um, you know almost eight months straight now uh, is a very, very good thing. Yeah. And it's, it is important to reflect, like you said, I, I love when people will put the, the, you know, memes or just, I guess, just straight tweets or data where, you know, you see every year, every four years where the price is at and where we've become. I, I think of, 
of fold a lot. And Will Reeves is talking about their maturation over the last five years of, of just being a savings asset and what Bitcoin is being true money, where their clients or customers just kept getting wealthier and wealthier. And they're like, we, we need to adopt this ourselves and just in, in denominate everything in this. So it's really fascinating in, in saying all that, what do you think the, the price or, you know, there's a lot of people like, why isn't it in the hundreds of thousands of yet or whatever? And there are big players coming in. What are your thoughts as to maybe why the price isn't, is it higher? Is it just because there's so much red tape and there's so many things you have to kind of deal with that the average person doesn't really see or realize? What is your take on, on that? Yeah. So my take on it is a lot of the gains Bitcoin was supposed to make this year were front loaded to the beginning of the year when the ETFs launched. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is um, there's a great deal of short interest right now on uh, micro strategy. And so um, there's a great deal of short interest and people are uh, trying to squeeze those shorts out of the market. And that's driving a lot of shorts out of their positions and driving micro strategies price up while Bitcoin uh, kind of moves down. Um, and so, you know, I do think that that there is a great deal of short pressure in the market. People don't want to see this thing succeed. But I think the main reason is just zooming out. We have an election coming up in 25 days. Um, we say it's the most consequential one of our lifetimes every single cycle, but I think this one more so than most. I, I generally do not get political, but the reality is here in this country, and I'm definitely feeling it in Massachusetts, is we've had, uh, you know, the, the estimate is 20 million plus illegal migrants if you go back in time and you you look at real data, it's probably closer to 60 million people who are in this country that shouldn't be here, that are here illegally. And so people are viewing this con this election as extremely consequential. And as such, price action in the most high beta, right, the most high sensitive risk assets, such as Bitcoin, uh, is very muted. And that reflects a lot of kind of will they, won't they mentality. People don't want to dive into the market and go fully long because of the uncertainty revolving around the election. That's not to say that if Kamala Harris gets elected, Bitcoin's going to zero. Um, but certainly she has less of an accommodative framework toward Bitcoin and other crypto stuff than Donald Trump does. And so I do think that because it's such a toss up and also generally during elections, you do have this kind of uncertainty that drives more muted price action uh, until the election happens and we move past that. Uh, I think, um, you know, we're probably in for a very boring October. It was looking like uh, we were setting up really well for October at the start of the month. We had the best September on record for Bitcoin. Um, and so historically, October has been Bitcoin's best month. But given that we're headed into an election year, and given that the launch of the ETFs at the start of the year really drove a lot of capital into Bitcoin over the first three, four months that probably would have trickled into Bitcoin more gradually over this year, we probably would have experienced more stair step price action like we experienced last year, stair step upward trajectory rather than huge rocket upward trajectory like we saw. Um, and so those two factors combined are why Bitcoin is underperforming in my view. I believe that once we get into, once we get past the election, once we move past November 5th, then if the US can still avert recession, which by all accounts, it's looking that we can, we did get a kind of a hot jobless claims print yesterday, but that is a weekly series. And so it's important to remember that that can be volatile. Um, markets are pricing in a growth rebound. So the 10-year yield is back on its way up. Gold is back on its way up. Petroleum is back on its way up. So investors are pricing in the fact that instead of a growth slowdown in recession, which would drive demand lower, which would push people into the 10-year US Treasury uh, bill and drive its yield lower, its yield is, is, uh, is rocketing. 10-year 10 10 US Treasury note, rather. And so markets are estimating a growth rebound, not a growth slowdown, um, or even a recession. Recession risk is kind of off the table. Global liquidity is expanding because China just did this huge monetary bazooka. And on net, on aggregate, global central banks are cutting rates at their fastest pace since 2007, if you exclude uh, 2020, which was all of that emergency measures. So really, after this election, we have the most favorable macro backdrop. Well, currently, we have the most favorable back macro backdrop that Bitcoin has seen since 2020 and 2021, when we first crested those new all-time highs that we've since broken. Uh, but the election uncertainty is driving a lot of the underperformance that Bitcoin is experiencing right now. And so I believe that once we move past the election, Bitcoin will be able to benefit much more more from that favorable macro environment than it is right now. So all things considered, that's kind of where my head is at. That's what my thesis is. Um, there is some external short pressure on Bitcoin. People are trying to blow up micro strategy to no avail. Its stock is rocketing. 
People are also buying MicroStrategy uh, in droves in order to kind of squeeze out those shorts. Um, they're trying to make something like a GameStop 2.0. There certainly isn't that much short interest on MicroStrategy like there was with GameStop, but there is a considerable deal. People are trying to squeeze MicroStrategy out of their positions, and that probably involves uh, a great deal of uh, shorting MicroStrategy as well as selling Bitcoin or applying artificial short pressure to Bitcoin via futures contracts. So. I believe that we, we do have that, but at the same time, Bitcoin front ran a lot of its gains this year. And so um, this was kind of the equilibrium price for the end of the year. That was probably inevitable, something like seventy five dollars to $80,000. And also heading into the election, there's a great deal of uncertainty. We have a very favorable macro environment with the Fed and other global central banks now cutting rates. Growth is back on the rise. People are accelerating, uh, ex expecting a growth reacceleration. And so Bitcoin can be the beneficiary of all of that once the election is in the rearview mirror, I believe. So in your case, and you kind of were alluding to it, I, I believe, which where, where do you follow uh, or what's most closely, what does Bitcoin track most closely in your opinion? Is it, is it M2? Like what are, what are you looking at when you're kind of, when you're seeing the, the, the most, uh, know, I guess the highest correlation, I guess, what, what's the, some of the biggest factors you're kind of looking at just globally? Yeah. So it has to do a lot with global liquidity, which factors in global bond prices as well as global bond volatility. And, um, you know, global bond prices are back on the rise as yields fall, as global central banks cut and people kind of jump into uh, treasuries um, at this stage. Uh, and so as treasuries increase in price, the capacity for lenders to lend increases and global liquidity rises. Liquidity or the capacity of capital, right, balance sheet capacity is different from money supply. Um, there's a big misconception. People kind of conflate those two terms, but there is a bit of a difference. Global M2 is also expanding. So the M2 money supply is also on the rise. Um, it's accelerating in its rate of growth. So Bitcoin is tightly correlated to both of those things. Uh, as balance sheet capacity expands uh, as a result of muted or falling treasury volatility and rising treasury prices, then uh, risk taking can expand as well. Global liquidity is an expansion mode. So too do risk assets expand. And so Bitcoin is tightly correlated with global liquidity as well as the global M2 money supply. This obviously feeds into the narrative why a lot of people are in Bitcoin is because they won't stop printing money uh, but you can't print any more Bitcoin. It's certainly why I'm in Bitcoin and why I'm holding it for the long run. Um, well, actually, no, for the viewers of this show, I don't own any Bitcoin. Um, just operational security stuff there. I don't own a single sat. Um, but anyway, yeah, people are in Bitcoin because they pr can't print any more of it. And so as the money supply gets printed, obviously, uh, Bitcoin becomes uh, worth more, right? As the money supply expands, new money gets printed into existence, dollars get devalued, Bitcoin rises in price. So it's tightly correlated with both of those things. From a cross asset perspective, um, correlations shift um, like between risk and rates. There is sometimes a an inverse stock bond correlation. There sometimes is a positive stock bond correlation. Right now, as yields are back on the rise and stocks are rising too, we have an inverse stock bond correlation. But that changes, um, and so it's important to to monitor that. Um, but it's also important to remember that Bitcoin trades very closely in line with uh, sense, very tech heavy uh, stock indices like the NASDAQ. Um, it trades very closely in line with small cap stock indices like the Russell. So we know that Bitcoin is this apex risk off instrument. That is to say that because it's absolutely scarce and immutable, nobody can change its rule set. Nobody can add, uh, create more Bitcoin than its sub 21 million fixed supply. It should trade like gold. People buy gold because it's uh, relatively scarce. People buy gold for its scarcity and the whole narrative that you can't print more of it. It's a flight to safety during geopolitical risk, etc. Uh, Bitcoin should trade in line with gold. People should be going to Bitcoin in good times and bad as their uh, primary wealth preserver. But they don't. They trade it like the NASDAQ. That's what the algorithms trade Bitcoin like. And so we can't fade that in the near term. So Bitcoin obviously is a beneficiary of all this global money and global liquidity expansion. Um, but it's also uh, the beneficiary. Uh, well, it's also tightly correlated with the NASDAQ, with the S&P 500, with the Russell. Uh, so that's how Bitcoin trades. And so, so long as the environment is risk on, Bitcoin stands to appreciate more than the rest of the risk bucket, more than other risky stock stocks and stock indices, because it's so tiny. Um, it's only a $1.1, $1.2 trillion market cap. 
So because it's so small relative to things like the S&P 500 at $45 trillion in size, it appreciates more when it's all when it's risk on. And right now it's it's totally risk on. But these extraneous factors such as the ETFs getting launched at the start of the year, and then I believe Bitcoin front running a lot of the gains that were supposed to be spread out over the year, as well as the election that I touched on earlier, Bitcoin is underperforming relative to the rest of uh, the market currently. I believe that once the election has passed us and we move into uh, Q, you know, the, the, the rest of Q4, you know, the month and a half, uh, the month and three quarters that is uh, to go after the election, I think Bitcoin stands to do quite well. Uh, this range that we've been in uh, is, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars in size, um, you know, uh, that we've been consolidating and moving down. I tend to think just historically from a technical analysis standpoint, that the breakout above this range, if we get it, uh, if the economy remains intact and so risk-taking remains intact, it'll be equivalent to the size of the range. So the top of the range right now is something like um, $71,000, $72,000. I think a move out of this range to something like eighty six, eighty seven, eighty nine thousand dollars $89,000 uh, by the end of the year is something that very well could happen if the US averts recession um, and Bitcoin can kind of play a little bit of a catch-up trade to the rest of the risk bucket. So that's what Bitcoin is most tightly correlated to, right? It's the best instrument that you want to get into if you think that they're going to print money forever, which they are. It has something like a 25x sensitivity to the global M2, to the change in global M2 money supply. So if global M2 is rising at a pace of like 5%, like it is now, Bitcoin appreciates by 125%. So it's, it's, it is highly sensitive to moves in the global money supply. Um, in times of contraction, Bitcoin contracts by a huge amount. But in times of global money supply expansion, like we're experiencing now, Bitcoin is the best vehicle to allocate to if you want to hedge yourself against that, if you want to preserve your purchasing power. So that's what I look for. That's what Bitcoin is correlated to. And then over the long run, as it grows larger in size, as people begin to understand it as an asset instead of as a trading vehicle, then I think Bitcoin shifts more into that risk off bucket and people buy it mostly to insulate themselves from money printing and geopolitical risk instead of just trading it like a NASDAQ adjacent tech stock. Yeah, well said. It's, it's, it's something that is it's hard to wrap your your mind around, right? The average person is just not thinking of these things. Yeah, especially in, in first world countries, you know, it's just something that it's uh, a sailor says you, it's a need to know basis, right? Uh, so it's <laughs> haven't had enough bad things happen yet in first world countries. So uh, I guess that shall be seen. But I want to before we get into it, I want to ask you about micro strategy a bit. Speaking of sailor and just printing in general, where the dollar is going. However. I do want to ask you, because the last guest we had on was Justin Nazaroff of Phoenix Ammunition, who had uh, you know a question. So we're doing a question now for the last or for the next guest. And uh, which, by the way, awesome account for anyone uh, looking for a, a really fun meme account, Bitcoin or meme account. Uh, so go check out Phoenix Ammunition. Uh, he was he was asking for you. Um, what what do you think? about say a Putin or a Xi or someone coming into Bitcoin that we know is, you know, an, an enemy of the state. Uh, it's going to be, have all kinds of narrative against, you know, Bitcoin. So say tomorrow Putin says, Hey, we are going all in Bitcoin. We're mining it's legal tender or it's G or it's North Korea, you know, something like that. All of a sudden Bitcoiners have this, this, the meme of it's for our enemies. What happens when the world is now pointed at you and all of us Bitcoiners are in the crosshairs, really, literally, literally and figuratively of, hey, guys, you're standing with so and so. And we saw what happened four years ago, obviously. What happens at that point? I, I think this is a fascinating thing that I think about a lot, but you just don't hear anywhere like the probabilities of this actually happening, and which I think are greater than than not. So what what do you think <laughs> when it comes to something uh, like that? Yeah, so Bitcoin certainly is money for enemies. If you're liking this interview, but you're just wondering, you know what, Brandon, this is amazing stuff. And I, I get you have these guests on and they're talking about how orange pilling the world is so great and how Bitcoin is going to take over the world. How in the world do I educate my family and friends? How do I get people to understand what most people just don't care about, quite honestly? Bitcoin trading cards is the way to do that. When you open up these cards, you see the foil cards, you see the chase, you see the glossy cards. 
young, old, boy, girl, man, woman, it doesn't matter. People love these cards. It's awesome because they're super valuable, by the way. Amazing little side note. However, it Trojan horses them into the most important thing of the day. It's not politics. It's not all the things that we fight about. It's changing the money. Fix the money. Fix the world. Bitcoin trading cards is the best way that we have going in order to do that, no matter who you are. You're going to love them. Playable characters 10 for 10% off at checkout. Playable characters 10, 10% off at checkout. BTC-TC.com. You're going to absolutely love these things. Now back to the show. I think that if our adversaries begin adopting a really accommodative Bitcoin strategy, then I think it just drives the United States to do the very same thing but uh, at a larger scale and even more accommodative. I would liken this to uh, the space race and then even following the space race or during the space race, the Cold War that went on for many years afterward. We were all racing to be the first country to land a man on the moon. In the same way, I think that if our adversaries begin uh, begin adopting a framework around Bitcoin to draw capital allocators, Bitcoin miners and Bitcoin companies to their countries and they start uh, mining Bitcoin at the national level or making it easier for Bitcoin miners to operate. And then even you could take it to its uh, its highest form, which would be a treasury reserve allocation um, into Russia's treasury or into China's treasury. Then I think that just makes the United States even more incentivized to do the very same thing, uh, but better. So buying more Bitcoin than China or Russia, allocating it Uh, allocating to it at a faster rate, making the environment more favorable for Bitcoin companies to operate here stateside. I think that instead of an adversary adopting Bitcoin being met with a response from the United States, that's like, you know, now that uh, China is using this, now that Russia is using this, we're going to go and executive order 6102 part two, civil asset forfeiture, give us all your Bitcoin. Uh, I, I think that instead of that, I think the United States will be driven uh, through incentives to embrace Bitcoin more than it already is and begin really forcefully allocating to it. Um, we are the world's reserve currency and everybody wants our debt. So it's easier for us to raise money than anybody else. And so being able to issue debt and purchase Bitcoin using the proceeds and allocate to the tre- to allocate it to the US Treasury, or even just taking the existing Bitcoin we have now as a base, and then dollar cost averaging a certain amount every month, every week, or every quarter into uh, digital Fort Knox, is the United States likely response in the event that China or Russia begins doing it. That's what I believe will happen. Uh, I don't believe that because Bitcoin cannot be stopped, even in a communist country like China, Bitcoin is still used, Bitcoin mining still occurs. I think the United States is well aware of this. Um, and so I think that if one of our adversaries began adopting Bitcoin as into their treasury, we would do the very same and we would try to do it faster than our enemies, which would mean that instead of the governments working against us, the governments would be working for us. Instead of the money printer being levied against citizens and stealing our purchasing power, the money printer would be leveraged to accumulate more and more Bitcoin. Yeah, that'd be incredible. I love that answer, though. I love that answer. Uh, what? So going going back a, a little bit um, to what we were talking about previously, and kind of tangentially related to this a bit. You, you know, you mentioned they're printing forever, and you know it's a debt based system. I wholeheartedly agree you have to right there's no you can't pay down the debt when they're when you get rid of all their money there's only debt left so it implodes and so you have to print forever are we really at that exponential point it feels that way of you know we could be at 100 trillion debt by the next couple of years maybe by the next uh, election or maybe at the end of the decade and the dollar loses another 99 percent of value from here w- at what point do you see the average person waking up? Because I mean, it really is just a confidence game, right? So at what point do the cracks become big enough in your eyes? And have you seen enough cracks in the system where people have woken up? And you're in, you're in Massachusetts and, and I'm in Michigan. So we have some states that are, you know, generally, uh, well, we won't go down that road, but they, you know, are people waking up, I, I guess, is, is the moral of the story. I thought 10, 15 years ago, people is, would have started waking up, but I, I can't, I'm stunned at how long it's taken for people to wake up. So what say, what say Joe? Yeah. So I think the mag, I mean, we, people have been on this, people have been on the debt problem for ages. Um, you know, people like the, the Ron Paul, Ron Paul's of the world try to make a run of the presidency, um, you know, in 08 that didn't pan out. People really haven't seen it as a huge issue, but now the hot button topics for this election uh, are twofold. It's immigration, number one. And inflation, number two. That's what people are most concerned about. And I think yesterday, 
there, we're, we're at a tipping point in this country where more people recognize the problem. And so more people are trying to figure out what on earth is causing it. The greedy corporations narrative is dead. It's so dead, it's not even funny. Because Kamala Harris is running her campaign around the Elizabeth Warren strategy of blaming companies for inflation and saying that price gouging is what's causing inflation. Donald Trump is leading her by 9.9% .9 in the polls on poly market as of today. Those are not polls, obviously it's a betting market, but I tend to think because money is on the line and it's not just humans being asked, actual capital is up um, for grabs. And this is a multi-billion dollar market. I tend to believe poly market than I believe the polls, um, which Trump is also leading in. He's leading in every swing state, and he is not talking about ending price gouging. Um, he's talking about our huge. He's he's spoken a few times about the the debt problem. So people are coming around to this. He's now the leading candidate, and so as this problem becomes worse, people naturally want to figure out what is actually going on. Um, Price controls do not work. They never work. We've seen it with the minimum wage. Um, you know, when minimum wage laws are enacted very quickly, people become priced out of rents. Um, food prices get more expensive, etc. So if you start setting the price that grocery stores can charge, um, then that problem is only exacerbated and inflation is worsened. It does nothing to fix your purchasing power. People are now, as a problem gets so bad, people want to know the root cause. And people are discovering the root cause as they're accelerating debt burden. If you take a look at just a linear chart of the total national debt, uh, and you go back all the way to the 60s and 70s, and you look at it today, our rate of debt issuance is increasing. Um, just 10 years ago, uh, this time that I'm speaking to you now, uh, the national debt was at $17.5 trillion. It's at $35.6 trillion. So it has literally doubled in a decade. Um, and at the start, the first day of the fiscal year, we had a, uh, uh, the first week of the fiscal year, we had a $354 billion net increase in the national debt. That's insane. That's very insane. And now our interest expense is the uh, second to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, it, these unfunded liabilities, is the second biggest line item on um, the United States Treasury's expense sheet. It's now higher than the national defense spending. And so when you go to your neighbor and you say, hey, did you know that we're spending more on our, the interest on our national debt than we are on our military? That's kind of a big eye opener most people get extremely shocked by because you'd think that the United States with the world's biggest and strongest military might would be spending most of what it earns on fortifying that and building that and maintaining it. But we're actually just paying off our uh, creditors is what we're doing um, because rates have been so high for so long. And as a result of that, what we're doing is we're increasing the rate of debt issuance that's accelerating in order to pay down our debt. Um, and so this issue has become not catastrophic, but it is, it is approaching catastrophic level because that's what we're doing. Um, you know, as auction sizes get bigger, people are, people can only buy so many U S treasuries. Uh, and so then the marginal buyer will have to become the federal reserve and all money an increasing amount of the money that goes to buy the national debt will be freshly printed money. And so, not only will the US government be spending money into the real economy, driving prices higher, but the Federal Reserve will be printing new money in order to buy that debt. So that's what's happening. Um, that is, that's what's going on. It's becoming a catastrophic problem. We're not there yet, but the problem is accelerating. As it gets worse, people are searching for the root causes instead of just lazily blaming corporations and price gouging and any number of empty platitudes that these politicians like Elizabeth Warren have trotted out in front of us. Uh, so I think that there will always be non-playable characters who will blame price gouging and will blame the rich people and will blame the billionaires. But we've seen what happens when you try to tax the rich. Norway lost $500 million last year because they raised their wealth tax. People left the country. They, they were expecting a $143 million increase in their tax revenue. They got a net $443 million loss in their tax revenue. So taxing the rich isn't a solution. The only solution is austerity. And that may mean recession, but it's one that we're going to have to weather. Um, and because the Fed has like a no recession mandate, it doesn't want recession to occur under any circumstances. And it will widen the money printer out as, as wide as it needs to go in order to avert one. I think the fiat endgame is just a melt up in the debt load, um, a, a collapse in the value of the United States dollar, which is accelerating. 
And then people flooding into things like Bitcoin, because as people see the price continually rises, even after it dies, right? There have been thousands of Bitcoin obituaries through the years. They're going to look toward things like gold to hedge their bets. They're going to look like things to look at things to Bitcoin that cannot be diluted to hedge their bets. So I think to answer your question, like when does the normie wake up? Um, I think that the, the the normal person wakes up once we start raising taxes even more than we already do. Um, right now, uh, we're paying something like uh, ten thousand dollars a year uh, in property tax for the home that I'm in now. It's insane. It's getting really bad. They're increasing it. And we're increasing it because there's more government spending going on. We're now building migrant shelters and, and housing specifically for migrants in this suburban Massachusetts town. And that has to get funded with taxpayer money. So as taxes increase, as grocery prices increase, people are going to look to what is the actual root cause. And the root cause is reckless government spending and money printing. And the solution time and again is Bitcoin. So we just have to keep banging the drum that Bitcoin is the life raft, people understand and know the problem over time. As it gets worse, uh, you and I just have to keep doing our part about drawing people into Bitcoin and helping them recognize it as the solution to their problem. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. What you, it sounds like you are thinking it will be a more of an inflationary uh, or hyper, hyperinflationary or, or inflationary crash versus a deflationary you know, event, uh, you know, Sands the 1929 depression style, correct? Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. Yeah. Because now the Federal Reserve, obviously, it has this dual mandate. Everybody knows it's full employment and stable prices. And they oscillate between the two. When the labor market is getting to, uh, when the labor market is loosening, when it's unwinding, layoffs are elevated, they lower rates at the cost of raising inflation. And then inflation gets above target and then they raise rates. So it's this constant trade-off. The idea that humans can effectively um, set the price of money is a foolish one. And it's proven time and again that all it, all it leads to is an increase in the overall price level. Uh, I think <clears throat> we'll look back 200 years from now and look at the idea of targeting a rate of monetary debasement at 2% every year as barbaric and anti-human. And uh, so, yeah, I think because... We the third mandate of the United States Federal Reserve is to avoid recession at all costs and to make sure that financial assets always go up so that consumers can continue consuming. That will lead to a continued melt up in the CPI, continued melt up in asset prices and the asset price that can't be created out of thin air like a stock certificate can is Bitcoin. So yeah, that's that's where my head is at. I don't think we'll get a deflationary bust because we live in a global credit system. People need to continually borrowing and spending and lending needs to chug along and deflation and economic recession are not good for that. So I think it's just we're in for several decades of of really bad price inflation and economic expansion. GDP will continue being positive, but people will feel increasingly destitute, spending more and more on credit cards and having less savings in the bank. I think that's the way that we're headed as opposed to a deflationary bust and an economic recession. Because if we have a sustained recession, the global credit system collapses. If people stop consuming and spending and borrowing, then that's what happens. So um, we need to keep diluting the money in order to make that happen. Rates need to stay low in order to make that happen. Capital allocation is going to grow more inefficient. And uh, the world around us is going to continue uh, moving toward people feeling destitute. And um, as a result, it'll it'll drive more people to Bitcoin over time. Would you, would you consider that a, a stagflationary environment that we're kind of in or going into for a while? Or, you know, you know the, the de debt doom loop, you know, debt spiral, that's kind of, in essence, what we're talking about. Like it's thrown around a lot. Obviously, you know, Lavish is always talking about uh, that. And, you know, numerous people um, were all kind of pontificating on it. But it just feels that way. I mean, I know what stagflation is higher, you know, higher rising unemployment and higher inflation or rising inflation. Um, what, I mean, is that, does that sound what it like, what it will be like to you or how do you kind of see that? Yeah. So I think, I think low growth and high inflation 
is the path of least resistance over the next several decades. At the very least, low growth and poor prospects and falling wages for heritage Americans, for people who were born here or immigrated here the right way. Um, because a lot of the rise in the unemployment rate, even Jerome Powell said it, was a function of more people entering the labor force, um, migrants entering the labor force. So I think for people who lived here and have lived here will continue to be hollowed out by opportunists who move here solely for economic reasons, which has been the case since uh, for the last like 50 years, the last 50, 60 years, but increasingly so in the last decade, that's going to continue getting worse. So I think you know GDP will continue to be supported and um, GDP will probably continue being positive, but that consumption is not going to come is going to come increasingly less from people who live here and pay taxes and do things the right way and raise families, and uh, more from migrants who come here solely for economic purposes. Uh, this problem is accelerating, and that's why you've seen even in Silicon Valley, uh, most VCs are now avowedly backing Donald Trump because even they see the problem here: um, low low skill, um, blue collar work. Uh, where Americans 100 years ago were able to support themselves off of that. Uh, a mechanic earned $20,000 annually in 1913, right around the time the Federal Reserve came into play, and an engineer earned $30,000. Not a big disparity between the two. Um, in 2000, a mechanic, the median mechanic salary was something like 22000 bucks a year. An engineer's salary was closer to 70 or 80. So it's the the, the gap between... Uh, th this this causes the stratification in skill, in labor skill and income to widen out. Whereas previously, if you were a very skilled laborer or a non-skilled laborer, you could still support a family. Uh, now that's not the case. If you were an unskilled laborer, you have to work several jobs in order to make ends meet or uh, be at the very top of whatever organization you're in in order to make ends meet. And we're uh, Americans are constantly being priced out of their low-skilled work by people who are coming to the country and willing to do it for far less. And so as the labor supply of unskilled laborers increases um, and the tax system remains complex, I think the wealthy will continue getting wealthier and people who are unskilled and didn't really win in the... Uh, um, the IQ lottery, I suppose, uh, it'll it'll continue becoming harder for them. The problem is that policymakers do not care about low skilled blue collar workers. Unfortunately, they care about white collar jobs and high skilled jobs, doctors, engineers, lawyers. They care about making life better for them and not for the majority of Americans. Uh, you have to remember, whatever whatever job you have, um, you know, half of Americans. Uh, uh, well, well, on average, half of Americans um, have a worse job. Um, you know, they have a worse salary, right? If you are if you are earning like a hundred k, a hundred ten, a hundred twenty k a year, you got to realize that you know the 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 mean median income in the United States is around uh, 60, 60, 65,000 bucks. And so, if you think sixty five thousand bucks in Massachusetts, you're looking at like a one bedroom apartment in the suburbs uh, in order to support yourself and maybe a spouse and maybe one kid if you could really stretch and make ends meet. So I think that's a really roundabout way of saying um, it's going to become harder, increasingly so, as we as we uh, uh, basically have an open border policy and this terrible fiscal problem, um, where life becomes more expensive and harder for people who are doing things the right way in this country, um, and that will lead to more people feeling destitute and uh, lost and forgotten, and it's just going to continue giving rise to people calling for things like ending the Fed uh, and you know uh, nationalism here in the United States, fully shutting down this globalist idea that excuse me, human beings are fungible. So let's import all of the cheap labor that we can. Uh, <clears throat> I think that is the that is the cultural zeitgeist that we're shifting to. That's what gave rise to Donald Trump in 2016. And it's what giving it's giving rise to uh, his potential reelection in 25 days here in 2024. So all of this is a very big problem. As average Americans' lives are are made harder and worse by the constant influx of new workers who are willing to do their jobs cheaply, um, that's going to continue giving rise to really, really uh, upset sentiment toward the powers that be. And so more inherent skepticism toward globalists, more inherent skepticism toward the elite. So I think growth will probably remain positive, but not positive because Americans' lives are better. 
rather positive because uh, we're importing a great deal of labor who's willing to undercut the wages and, and lifestyle of uh, of average Americans. So I think high inflation, persistent inflation, probably around, you know, we're going to raise the inflation target formally or informally to two and a half percent annually. That's where we are now, uh, two and a half to three percent annually. That's going to be the new normal. So the increase in prices is, is going to accelerate. It, it, it has accelerated and it is at an accelerated pace compared to where we have been historically, one and a half to two percent. And that's going to be the path of least resistance over the next several decades. I think GDP will probably remain positive. Economists will probably clink their champagne glasses together and say that we did it. We, we we're accomplishing wonders. The United States has been in uh, expansion mode for several decades. But over that period of time, life will become harder for, for people who live here and work here and support families. Yeah. And you, you touched on this earlier too. I, and I couldn't agree more with this sentiment of just like people look back hundred years from now, 200 years from now, and just really figure you guys were living in a modern dark age, you know, like, what were you doing? You know, just the, the mass war, you know, taking out your own children, not protecting your children. I mean, just on and on and on. And it's kind of masked by technological advancement, right? This rapid exponential technological advancement, which has masked a lot of these problems, these underlying societal issues, familial issues, yeah. things of that nature. So it's, I it's have a supercomputer in my pocket. Why did my great grandfather earn you know, earn a better living and was able to start a family earlier than my peers are. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like, it's masking a lot of these problems that we're now starting to really see the ramifications of. So in saying that, do you, and you kind of touched on this too, is why I made me think of it, but the, the brain drain, like I saw here in Michigan in the last 50 years, where it's the wealthiest city on earth, the automobile industry, and then people leaving because of terrible leadership, you know, really not following the rule of law, like whatever it was, be, people just leaving. And you see that at a society level, you're seeing it at a state level right now in the last five years, you're, you can see it at a country level. I mean, that's, that's something that I think about for the U.S., you know, just being from here and just saying, hey, this is the greatest country on earth, I believe. And it, that's a worrisome to me. You know, we don't follow the rule of law. We're attacking political people. Uh, you know, you kind of look around and like, well, yeah, that's what other countries are doing, right? They're like, well, why would I invest in your bonds? Or why? That's why we have the greatest markets in the world is because people believed in the rule of law or things of that nature. And now we're seemingly going back on all these things. I mean, is that something that you worry about just at that macro level? Yeah. Yeah. We have politicians that are increasingly abandoning the social contract and abandoning the people that they promised to work for in lieu of atomizing the idea of the individual and basically saying that, look, you are as worthwhile to me as an American citizen, my constituent that voted for me and pays taxes and lets me do my job as somebody who I'm going to import from Colombia, who's going to bring their whole family up here, you know, jam seven people into a one bedroom apartment and then undercut your wages and drive prices up and drive rent up. Um, because you are atomized now. I don't care about you. Uh, people are beginning to realize that and wake up. And again, like I said, I think that is the that is where the cultural zeitgeist is headed. If the United States as the global leader cannot work for its citizens, well, who does it work for? And that is increasingly the question that many people are asking and many voters are asking. And one of the reasons why this election is so consequential is because if the rate of illegal migration continues on the route that it currently is, then uh, there won't be any more swing states. We've seen a uh, several hundred fold increase in the amount of illegal migrants in places like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ar <clears throat> Arizona, all of the major swing states. And um, you know, as a result of that, if we have four more years of this, basically all bets are off for kind of this uh, wholly democratic national regime. And we've seen that obviously neither side really works for their citizens as much as as much as they used to. The idea that like you know the politician you vote in will work for you is hogwash. It's total nonsense. They have special interests, and lining their pockets is much more important to them. But Americans won't have a choice. Uh, if we get four more years of this, of, of what we've experienced, let alone eight more years of this. And so really, this is the last ditch effort for Americans to vote for the politician that is seemingly saying he's going to work for the American people and prioritize us. But yeah, no, it doesn't... Th it does threaten the United States position on a global stage, I think, over a multi-decade time horizon if politicians continue proving that they can't create a favorable environment for actual Americans and they're more interested in padding their pockets um, and uh, working for foreign interests rather than their own people. I think that is the, that's the biggest problem today. I think that is what is at stake in this election. And um, yeah, no, I certainly think that uh, 
if we don't reverse course and reverse course quickly, uh, America will quickly lose its position as the place that everybody wants to move to. It's the land of opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, it will quickly become uh, a shell of its former self. It certainly already is, but, but the path toward that is accelerating. I not agree more. Uh, I, before we get to uh, micro strategy and, and the infinite money glitch and just all the things that Sailor uh, is, is doing, I know you have uh, many different thoughts on that. You, some of you just tweeted out too, and, and we we talked about what Norway is doing, stuff like that, and some of the things that you've been thinking of and it's on your mind lately. And going to this brain drain or just whether it's the immigration problem, we just can't figure out. Uh, but you were talking about Massachusetts and the EBT cards and a third, well, over a third of Massachusetts is on some some sort of financial assistance from the state. Um, this is, which makes me think of Mitt Romney um, comically, and this is 12 years ago. And I mean, you think about that, it was 12 years ago, holy cow, or actually more, I guess, during that campaign when he was saying that the 47% lives off of, or 47% of the country is paying for everyone else in essence. And the numbers just have been bearing this out, right? Which was just fact and logic, even at that time. And he got hammered for it. Uh, and so now I just, I read your tweet and I just laughed. I just thought of that immediately. Um, of, and this has got to be, have you looked into any of the other states by chance? Because this has got to be a, a national thing. I, I would venture to guess each state is probably looks similar to this. No. <laughs> Every state definitely looks similar to this. Uh, I have not looked specifically at states, but if you look at Massachusetts and you understand that it is um, per capita one of the wealthiest states in the country, it is the single most expensive state to live in from a housing and property tax perspective, then you can bet that in poorer states, this problem is much worse. And there are a much smaller portion of net producers who are producing and paying for the net consumers to live there. And so even if you break it up on a household basis, like you say, uh, we have 2.6 million EBT cards being used in the United in Massachusetts. That's a 650,000 uh, increase from that time last year, from around June 2024 to June 2023, 650,000 uh, EBT card increase. And you look at it from a, a, a population perspective, Massachusetts has about 700,000 residents, uh, seven, 7 million residents rather. And um, uh, we have the 260, uh, 2.6 million, 2.7 million uh, uh, EBT cards. And so they're only, that, that's already 37% of Massachusetts on EBT. If you just say that there's one EBT card per Massachusetts resident, and I certainly won't claim to be the foremost authority on it, but if you break it up by a household perspective too, then there are 2.7 million households in mass and 2.6 million EBT cards. And so obviously this is, this is a, a huge case of fraud this is widespread, massive fraud. Obviously, households can have multiple EBT cards, but the notion that there is almost one-to-one -one households to EBT card ratio um, and this huge, massive increase um, in the amount being used since last year, it's a testament to the ballooning welfare state. And like you said, um, you know, about 60% of the population, if we just say that one EBT card is per person, 60% um, of the population is paying for the other 40%. That's not sustainable. We need to figure out a way to lift people up and allow more people to be net producers so they are not dependent on the state. Because what we've seen in places like Norway is the end game of all of this is you got to figure out how to fund it. And the Democrat side of things is saying, well, we'll fund it by taxing the rich. That does not work. Um, socialist politicians have been propagating this lie and this dream for ages. But in Norway, they introduced a massive new wealth tax. They increased it by a substantial amount. And what happened was it drove uh, it drove $54 billion worth of net worth from individuals out of the country and caused a net decrease in revenue by $440 million annually. So taxing the rich doesn't work. The, the idea that we can continue making people people dependent on the state by taxing the wealthiest among us to support um, the, the middle, lower class and the lower class is nonsense. It doesn't work. It leads to capital flight to countries with more favorable tax conditions and a more favorable economic environment. What needs to happen is the state needs to get out of the way. It needs to make it easier for businesses to operate. Maura Healy here in Massachusetts needs to stop using her emergency powers for silly things like making it harder for people to obtain a license to carry. Now, instead of just going to a class and then going and getting your registration, you need to go to a, a, a like a, a two 
20 hour seminars or something like that and then go to do live fire and then have a full background check and this and that and the other thing. And that's what she's spending her time on. She should spend her time on the economics of her state, making it easier for businesses to operate here and not drive businesses to Texas or Nevada or Arizona or any other place that has more favorable conditions for businesses to operate. Um, what's happening now in Massachusetts is capital flight. As you stop prioritizing the individuals and businesses who are net producers and begin prioritizing the people who we have to subsidize, you drive capital out of the state and you make it harder to do that. And you pair that with the fact that um, the these expenses, these line items like EBT cards and other welfare is increasing year after year. Um, ultimately, you're going to end up in a situation where people just say, I'm out. I'm out and you're already seeing that um, and you're, uh, uh, that's accelerating. So the, the welfare state is ballooning. It's occurring in Massachusetts and it's certainly occurring in other less wealthy states to a much larger degree. California is a great example of this. Um, you know, they're similarly wealthy like Massachusetts, but they might have a much higher percentage of their population that is on EBT. And uh, yeah, no, it's getting bad. It's a testament to um, capital misallocation at the state level and this idea that we can drive mass prosperity by taxing ourselves into oblivion. We drive prosperity by making energy you know, as abundant as possible. That's what enables human flourishing. We unlock energy. We embrace nuclear energy. And uh, we allow humans to flourish with the government getting out of the way, allowing them to create businesses, allowing them to become profitable, create more jobs, and lift people up from the bottom rather than bringing the top down to support the bottom so the bottom becomes dependent, making the bottom independent right? And that only comes from the government getting out of the way and making a more favorable economic environment for capital allocators. But that's not the route that many of these Democrat states, such as Massachusetts and California, are taking. Absolutely wild. Do you, do you uh, just have a handful of things here, just make you keep it, make me think of questions. Do, do you think that fiat, you know, the government printing currency in, in this fiat world we live in of, of them continually trying to paper over everything. Does that just make people not care eventually and just kind of tune out and just the numbers get so big and they just like, ah, whatever, because it's just like apathy is what it seems like to me where people just, they just kind of eyes glossed over and they're like, well, whatever, we'll just, they'll just print for it. You know, anyway, they'll just do whatever. And just kind of goes away and they just don't see that frog in the boiling pot. They don't see the prices until like the last four years things like this happen where it, it jars them a little bit. Still, a lot of people aren't there yet, but you know, I just, I, I, I just, I don't know any other way other than to people just being asleep and just fiat kind of putting you to a sleep in a way in this really, you know, putting you in the matrix, I guess. Yeah. Bread and circuses, but we've seen the consequences of apathy. We've seen what kind of taking a neutral stance does. Um, now it's come to a, it's come to a head. Everything that I've talked about is basically like we're at an inflection point where people are really beginning to care, but the problem is on the cusp, cusp of becoming insurmountable um, when it comes to the federal debt, when it comes to uh, the pace of money printing, when it comes to the pace of price increases, when it comes to immigration. We are on the cusp of not being able to turn this thing around. And so now people are being forced to care. Apathy is a losing position and taking the position that... Um, you know, everything's okay. I will let the government fix it for me. Uh, those, those, uh, those seeds are coming to uh, harvest now, and we're seeing the net result of that. And so, people are increasingly being forced to care. Over the last several decades, you know, you can fire up YouTube and distract yourself all day. You can scroll on TikTok and, and distract yourself every day. It's become so easy to consume and distract yourself. But now the problem is becoming so big. People are realizing I'm not going to be able to raise a family. I don't even know if I can afford to, 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 to support myself, let alone somebody else, let alone children. So now this problem for everyday Americans is becoming existential. And so people are being forced to care. People are being forced to bite down on their mouthpiece and vote for somebody that they might not like. Um, people are being forced to come to grapple with these hard truths of life. Like you can't print your way out of uh, a problem. You can't throw money at a problem and it becomes fixed, you need to let businesses uh, thrive and you need to let them become productive capital allocators so we can lift all of ourselves up rather than relying on the government uh, to do it. Uh, because people are learning that by creating social programs and giving it all to the government and let the government take care of it and they can pay for this and they can pay for that, that comes out of your pocket. And so, you know, in the form of taxation and in the form of inflation. So 
people are being forced to care. They're being forced to grapple with these hard realities as a problem becomes more and more present in their everyday lives. Um, it's becoming harder to distract yourself. And so I think a lot of people are waking up specifically because it's becoming harder to distract yourself with the problem so large and so looming. Do you think that last one, then we're going to talk about some micro strategy here a little bit. What do you think the, the, the unrealized gains thing that uh, like Kamala, Kamala has no idea she, she she couldn't explain what unrealized gains is to you, right? So I don't even know if she knows if she's a presidential candidate or not. I don't think she's. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you know, I think that's where it has to dawn on people of like, oh, wow, like this is coming from somewhere else. And in, in really, it's just this system has to perpetuate itself. Like we've been talking about this whole time. And it has to perpetuate itself. And it's it's really, to me, I look at it and I say, well, hey, it's just the powers that be saying, hey, we need to keep kicking this can down the road because we need to get the these this equity or the assets are on the sideline. We need to get them into the system somehow because otherwise it's going to collapse on its own weight. Um, what what are your thoughts when it comes to, to just the unrealized gains and just some of the things you kind of shake your head at? Yeah, they're looking at new strategies to squeeze all of the money out of people that they can. Uh, this is the end game. They're taxing money that hasn't even been made yet, you know. And we have these we have these exit taxes, like in the United States and in Norway too, where they do tax unrealized capital gains. They say that okay, you're leaving, you're renouncing your citizenship. Great, all the money that you made here, uh, we're gonna sell. We're going to basically cash out and tax you on it as if you sold that asset today. So that already exists in the form of an exit tax, but now the idea is that your we will introduce a a tax rate for unrealized capital gains. So, for instance, people who have a big stock portfolio and they haven't sold it, um, and they're borrowing against it, or they're borrowing against the value of their house that is appreciated by X amount over several years. Now uh, we're looking at taxing that, and so it's really the fiat end game. We're looking at taxing things that haven't even that don't even exist yet. We're looking at taxing money that isn't even in your pocket yet, and there really is no end to what the government is willing to do in order to to raise money instead of cutting spending. Um, this spending machine has no breaks. Every politician just wants to spend endlessly on their constituents, and it doesn't matter where the money is coming from. And the debt problem is so huge and so insurmountable now that we're now looking at ways at taxing money that hasn't even been made yet. And so for the Democrats, they are certainly salivating at the prospect of being able to go to somebody who's been uh, 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 putting money up and, and paying down their mortgage over the last 10, 15 years, saying, hey, the value of your house is appreciated by 30%. We're going to tax you on uh, all of that on those unrealized gains by 15%, right? And so then automatically it becomes way less desirable to own a home or do any of these other things. You you drive the people who are the most efficient in this country, the producers, the doers, the business creators uh, out of the country by taxing money that hasn't even been made yet. It is a silly idea. It's a very stupid idea. And basic economics says that these people are going to leave the country. And then all of a sudden you, you've increased all this, uh, you've increased your spending projections because you're expecting all this new tax revenue to come in and it's not coming in because people are fleeing. And so you have to issue more debt in order to finance it. So it is a loser's game. Uh, it is a bad idea, but obviously the government will not, uh, will not, you know, they're, they're still going to pursue something even if it's a very stupid idea. So it's something that hopefully will not get through Congress. Um, but who knows? I mean, if Kamala Harris gets elected, then that chances are we may see something like that. But it's a very dumb idea that will make the United States poorer. Yeah. And file that away with uh, just wage controls, price controls, all those different things, rent rent caps, just everything. So that's, uh, boy, oh boy. Let's, let's hope you don't open up those cans of worms. But in saying that, MicroStrategy. I'd love for you to give some of your thoughts on MicroStrategy. I think of um, you know the, the infinite money glitch term gets thrown around a bunch now, and what sailors kind of opened up. I, coming from the real estate world myself, you know, you kind of see the Burr strategy, which is a very similar thing. Like real estate investors know the strategy, or at least many of them do, I should say, of the you know buying something with other people's money, raising money, and then fixing the the house up refinancing it and and putting a tenant in there and kind of just doing that over and over, which is an infinite return. I mean, if you can, if you can increase the value of the house and then refinance and pull all the cash out that you put in or that you raised and you have no money in the deal, that's an infinite return. So um, I would love for you to kind of touch on 
uh, Sailor and kind of what's going on with MicroStrategy and your your thoughts on on his playbook and and where you think this is kind of headed, I guess, in the future with other companies uh, catching on, small and big, starting to kind of see what's happening here and, and using this this uh, this playbook. Yeah. So since MicroStrategy adopted its Bitcoin strategy of issuing convertible debt in order to purchase Bitcoin, most of that convertible debt, basically every issue they've done becoming oversubscribed. Um, the MicroStrategy playbook is, you know, issuing debt at low rates in order to purchase Bitcoin, um, you know, as their stock price uh, appreciates because now they have Bitcoin on their balance sheet, their borrowing capacity also increases. And so they issue more shares as well as issue more convertible debt, rinse and repeat. They use some of their proceeds um, from uh, new shares in order to pay down convertible debt. They issue more convertible debt to buy Bitcoin. And this Bitcoin allocation strategy uh, has driven their stock price up from when they announced it in August of 2020 from like 14 bucks a share to 203 bucks a share. And obviously they had a 10 to 1 split, so like 140 to uh, 2,000 uh, bucks. And so that's crazy. That is insane. And uh, more companies, public and private, uh, a lot of public companies, Semler Scientific, Cathedral Bitcoin, uh, which trades on the Canadian Stock Exchange, now uh, MetaPlanet, which trades on the uh, Nikkei, I believe, uh, over in Japan. These companies are adopting the exact same strategy because they're seeing it is a very easy way to drive investor interest because everybody, Bitcoin is baited to the stock market. These Corporations that put Bitcoin on their balance sheet are beta to Bitcoin. Investors are always looking for an edge and a way to generate outsized returns. Companies with equities that have a Bitcoin treasury strategy wherein they accumulate Bitcoin and prioritize Bitcoin per share has proven to be an excellent way of generating shareholder value and an excellent uh, portfolio juicer, if you will, of getting outsized returns uh, within your portfolio. If you are mostly a Bitcoin holder, adding a little bit of MicroStrategy in there can, can, can help you juice uh, your returns. For a while, MicroStrategy was serving as the de facto Bitcoin ETF when there wasn't one here stateside. But either way, companies are seeing now that there's demand for Bitcoin on the balance sheet, and it is a great way to increase shareholder value uh, while also insulating your balance sheet and giving you a, a huge amount of cash. Uh, you've, you know, People call it the infinite money glitch. That's essentially what it is. As long as Bitcoin's price rises in perpetuity, this strategy uh, remains intact. And we've seen Sailor leverage this. We're now seeing similar scientific leveraging this. Um, Cathedra, uh, uh, MetaPlanet, and a whole host of other private companies that not a lot of people know about. I know a few private companies that are now passively and actively allocating to Bitcoin for their balance sheet. And it is a great way to adopt a treasury reserve asset that is uh, bulletproof to monetary inflation. Um, and so you've seen the huge outsized returns that can generate for Sailor. More companies are jumping on board. And I tend to think that it's going to be one of the most, if not the most popular trends in corporate finance over the next decade, given what we're seeing now, particularly when Bitcoin enters its bull market and the mania from retail investors comes onto the scene, you're probably going to see a big surge in companies adopting the MicroStrategy playbook because over a four-year period, they've been able to almost 20x their stock price. That is a very enticing value proposition for companies companies who may be uh, floundering around for public equities that have had very little interest. MicroStrategy is now on the cusp of being listed in the S&P 500, uh, and it is on the cusp of rising above its uh, dot-com bubble price. So yeah, it is an excellent strategy. Companies are certainly looking at it. Uh, more companies are adopting it, and there are plenty of companies out there that will help you uh, allocate Bitcoin to your treasury and plenty of storage solutions for it too. So I just think it's going to continue becoming more popular. Yeah, and I in in a minute we let, let's touch on uh, Thea obviously and what you guys are doing there. To, you know, speaking of uh, um, custody and things like that. So with MicroStrategy though, we have um, the, you know the four year cycle. Obviously, like this is why I brought up the real estate thing because real estate investors really haven't caught on to the Bitcoin thing yet, right? They haven't caught on to uh, like like I thought they were. I thought real estate investors would be some of the people that would kind of catch on earlier and just because it, because it is very similar. But in saying that though, this four year cycle is is different, right? Like if with a, with a renter, you can get, you know, payment that month, right? They're a, a resident, they are paying you and they're, you're getting a return to basically, um, you know, it mitigates that risk, right? Of taking on the loan. You're, you're taking the, you know, going short cash, you're hedging and you are taking on that risk, but you get rent each month or, or, or hopefully you get rent to, so, you know, to weather that storm where in Bitcoin, how, how can the average person or, or even some of the companies, I guess, kind of go either direction with it. How can you protect 
from that four year cycle, because the average guy I'm sure is looking at it and saying, well, Hey, if I go take a loan out, or if I'm going and, uh, you, you know, want some leverage and to get some Bitcoin here, uh, it, how, how am I doing that? How am I protecting it? Cause I have to kind of ride this four year cycle. And I, I'm guessing that's why generally hasn't caught on too much yet. Cause people are like, well, how do I know it's going up or how do I know this is going to happen? So I feel like we're in this weird inflection point where, like I mentioned, Will Reeves earlier, where like companies are realizing, and you mentioned a bunch of companies are realizing, hey, if I just put this on my treasury, whether I'm going with a leverage play and I'm taking out debt to buy more Bitcoin like Sailor is or not, I feel like we're in this weird inflection point where people are like, wait, this is going to keep going. It's going to keep happening. There's going to be more uh, volume in there. So it's going to keep going up long term because it is scarce, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and whether that, but also you know, whether that for your cycle, I guess, right? Because it's it's this weird uh, world where you have to be long term thinking enough, low time preference enough to be able to weather that storm. Or is it maybe the options market and the options that are coming on to so I would love for you to kind of touch on that maybe your thoughts on just how to weather that storm and what the average guy can do or is doing maybe that, um, that some of these big guys are, are, are employing. With the introduction of options on the spot Bitcoin ETFs, it's going to make a Bitcoin corporate treasury strategy even more desirable because now you have vehicles that will allow you to hedge your downside. Uh, you can you can put in a you can buy put options for Bitcoin uh, that are long dated. You know, if you expect Bitcoin as it historically has to draw down anywhere from you know. 25 to 30 percent over uh, 25 to 50 percent over its four year cycle. And if you think the four year cycle is still something that's going to occur, even as Bitcoin continues monetizing, you can now buy long dated puts or sell covered calls. Any, any number of strategies can be done in order to hedge your downside on Bitcoin. So as these financial vehicles get introduced, the Bitcoin corporate treasury strategy is going to become more popular. That's where my head is at. And so that's why I think these options are a huge game changer. And uh, Jeff Park uh, did a, an excellent write-up on this. I, I think he says that the options are actually going to make Bitcoin even less volatile because now these hedging strategies are going to get introduced. And I tend to be uh, within the exact same uh, belief framework that these this hedging these hedging strategies that are now available to people to hedge their downside uh, with Bitcoin makes it more attractive to do things like issuing debt in order to purchase Bitcoin for your balance sheet, and it's just going to drive drive the, the adoption even further. So I think that's the that's the chief mitigator that is now on the way that will uh, allow companies to weather this four year cycle. Obviously, the other way is to not issue debt. Um, or uh, to, to, to not issue debt and then use cash proceeds in order to invest in Bitcoin. Obviously there, you're missing out on a lot of the outsized uh, returns you can generate by buying more Bitcoin now. So if you are more convicted and do view this as a long-term play, um, using uh, debt issuance and using the, uh, using the uh, private markets in order to raise capital for purchasing Bitcoin, um, Doing so now will give you a huge outsized return in the future because you'll be able to add more Bitcoin to your balance sheet. Uh, but for people who are more on the fence, uh, you can use cash proceeds or do the do the debt issuance strategy for Bitcoin uh, uh, for Bitcoin purchases while hedging your downside using uh, options in the uh, uh, in in U.S. financial markets on these ETFs. So I think that with the emergence of options, it's going to make it easier for companies to weather their storm through complex hedging strategies. Interesting. Yeah, that's, I, I really hope so. Cause I just, I feel like that's that bridge between this real estate crowd and the real estate world and, and why people go into that so much. So anyway, very, very cool. What, so really quick on, on like the hurdle rate, I, I hear this, you know, people are really kind of thinking of this about this a lot now, whether it's, you know, Jack Mahler's uh, had done a couple of interviews recently or on his podcast and uh, whether again, Will Reeves, there's numerous people that have been talking about the hurdle rate. Sailor's been talking about it of, measuring everything in your life, especially your business, obviously, against that Bitcoin hurdle rate, whether it's call it 45%, 50, 65%, you know, uh, you know, or each year that you're trying to, should I do this marketing thing? You know, should I do that? Should I uh, hire this person or should I just invest in Bitcoin, put it on the treasury? Um, tell me about Thea and what you guys are doing and how you guys look at at this when you are, hey, we're investing in the business or or, or other businesses you were a part of in the past and how people might look at that and employ the standard, which is a very real thing. And again, just kind of we're hitting this inflection point where society is now measuring things against this this real 
control experiment, which is Bitcoin, this 21 million cap. So everything is, is coming against this. How do you do this? Like I said, tell me about Thea. And then also, how do you kind of view the this hurdle rate and the decisions you're making investments in your life? Yeah. So Bitcoin's rate of return, its combat annual growth rate is now being used um, as this uh, as a measure for whether like an investment outside of Bitcoin is viable or not. If an investment can exceed Bitcoin's compound annual growth rate, then that investment is considered viable. If not, it can it's it's typically rejected, right? So, you know that that's kind of as as things like Bitcoin per share um, become a financial metric, like key performance indicator for public equities, people are going to be looking toward uh, Bitcoin as uh, their chief kind of uh, determinant for whether or not they will invest in something else. If this investment can exceed the rate of return I'm earning on my Bitcoin, I will invest in it. If not, then I won't. Um, so I do think that that's growing more popular. Um, and obviously, as Bitcoin uh, gets onto more corporate balance sheets, uh, Bitcoin will be the chief barometer for which an investment is worthwhile or not. If your company uh, can generate for me a higher compound annual growth rate than what Bitcoin can generate in cold storage, just sitting there doing nothing in dollar terms, then you are investable. If not, you are not investable. Um, and as Bitcoin grows and matures and becomes larger and enters the mainstream as a macro financial asset, that that uh, measuring up against Bitcoin's compound annual growth rate will become uh, uh, more widespread. Uh, at Thea, we... That that is a framework through which we operate as well, right? If what we are doing, um, you know, can exceed the rate of return offered solely on Bitcoin, then it's worth doing. And we believe that simplified Bitcoin self custody is very much worth doing. The numbers bear that out, and the reality is that if Bitcoin is going to monetize to ten trillion, fifty trillion, a hundred trillion dollars. Um, then people need to be using it the way that it was intended, which is in self-custody. Uh, you need to send your Bitcoin to somebody else from your own wallet to an address, not through an exchange, not through an intermediary, not with any other counterparties. But the big problem has always been there is a level of technical know-how that's required in order to do that. People are terrified of Bitcoin and they don't understand it. They need somebody to hold their hand along the way. Um, the kind of the the test for whether or not a Bitcoin application is viable mass market is if grandma can use it. I love the cold card. You won't be able to give grandma a cold card and under the Christmas tree at Christmas and she'll know how to use it out of the box. It will require a lot of learning, a lot of training in order for her to use it. What we've done is at Thea, we've created an iPhone application and a web app that allow you to create simple and robust Bitcoin multi-sig vaults, both independently and collaboratively with other trusted contacts in a very simple way with all of your favorite hardware devices with no technical expertise required. So it's very revolutionary. Um, we are the first major mainstream Bitcoin-only consumer app that has been funded by Y Combinator. Historically, it is very difficult to go through Y Combinator if you don't offer other assets other than Bitcoin. But they too were able to see the value proposition that simple Bitcoin self-custody will have over the next five and 10 years. Uh, and it is a more, uh, you know, Thea in and of itself for people who are are helping, uh, you know, are, are are putting capital into us for for us to fund our operations as we go through these funding rounds, are viewing us as a more viable investment than just holding spot Bitcoin. And so I think that we went through Y Combinator as a Bitcoin only company is a testament to how the the, the high degree of utility, usability, and mass marketability that Thea has. And so really, the way that it works is extremely simple. Um, you, you download an iPhone app and you can get started right away. Um, basically, you click Create Vault. I've uploaded plenty of tutorials on this and people who are watching can try this themselves at home. If you don't have an iOS device, you could do it on the web app too, app.thea.us. Um, and go and set up a Bitcoin multisig vault with your favorite devices. You could use two cold cards if you'd like to. Um, it's a two of three setup, so Thea holds a recovery key. You're eliminating single points of failure by doing this. If you hold your Bitcoin on an exchange, you are susceptible to counterparty risk. FTX, you know, once seen as a Goliath um, in the Bitcoin custody industry, collapsed basically overnight because it, it proved that people were uh, FTX was using their Bitcoin fraudulently behind the scenes. You're absolving yourself of that when you take your Bitcoin into self-custody. But if you're holding your Bitcoin on a single wallet, 
it's a single point of failure. If somebody steals that wallet, your Bitcoin's gone forever. If someone steals your seed phrase, your Bitcoin's gone forever. When you introduce the need for two keys out of three keys in a setup in order to sign transactions and gain access to your funds, you're automatically eliminating single points of failure, making your Bitcoin more robust, which is in a set Bitcoin security setup more robust, which is a necessity as Bitcoin grows in price, more people are going to want to get their hands on it. So you shouldn't trust exchanges. And by doing a multi-sig instead of a single hardware wallet, you're also absolving yourself of human error. If you make some kind of error, if you lose a hardware wallet, you have another one. Um, and you also have Thea to help you recover your funds in the event that you do lose one of your keys. And so essentially, we help users custody their Bitcoin in the safest and easiest manner, in a self-custodial manner, um, but uh, without the need for extreme technical expertise. Um, you can set up two or three uh, Bitcoin uh, vaults uh, using all your favorite hardware wallets, we support all of them, um, with Thea being the entity that holds the recovery key. We gain access to it in the event that you lose one of your keys and you report it to us from within the app or within the web app. And it truly is revolutionizing Bitcoin self-custody. It, it never has been easier to set up a robust Bitcoin security solution in minutes with zero technical expertise required and no security trade-off. So that's what we're doing at Thea. That's the value prop behind us. We believe that in order to drive Bitcoin adoption, it's necessary that people have robust setups and they hold Bitcoin self-custodially and use it self-custodially the way that it was intended. Very cool. Very, it's, it's so cool to see the different companies and the, the, the inventions, I guess, but just the different solutions that are coming out, especially for retail. Uh, very cool to see. We're just the beginning of it too, which is just so wild to see. Um, all right. What, what, uh, really quick, your quick one minute version of, of how you got orange pilled. And then I want, and then I'm gonna have you uh, ask a question for the next guest here as we, uh, as we wrap. So I was orange pilled because I ran a, uh, painting company in my freshman year of college that summer. Uh, I, I was able to earn about 20, $25,000 from that, uh, post tax and I needed something to deploy it into. Around that time as well, my freshman year in college was uh, 2020. So they sent us home over spring break for COVID. And so I started having this huge aversion to the powers that be. Uh, I was kind of politically neutral. I didn't really care what the government did. I didn't really care what the Federal Reserve did. And all of a sudden, when they didn't let me go to college anymore and then forced me to do all these things in order to come back, it made me very skeptical of higher authority and whether they were really working for me. Around that same time, my friend Tyler, who works at BTC Inc. at the time, um, and he still does, he sent me two books to read, The Masters and Slaves of Money by Robert Breedlove and The Bullish Case for Bitcoin by Vijay Boyapati. Both of those orange pilled me very heavily. Being very young, being 19, my freshman year of college, I deployed literally all of what I had earned into Bitcoin. And um, you know, I was in it initially, as many people were, for number go up. But now I view it uh, as the single greatest tool to head yourself against the money printer and also the great enabler of human sovereignty. Uh, it is bringing property rights and the ability to preserve your wealth to 7.5 billion people around the world. So that's how I got orange pilled. Um, a little bit unconventional, but um, you know that's that's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. And I'm so ardent about Bitcoin, and I'm so passionate about uh, folding it into the macro picture and getting people who may be similarly averse to it to understand it as a macro asset and understand the utility behind it, and then help build consumer apps that that drive adoption. So cool. So cool. Um, all right. The next guest, I don't always know who the next person is going to be. However, we do know it actually is going to be Eric Kaysan will be the next guest. So um, do you have a question? It could be anything. It doesn't have to be related to Eric necessarily, but a question for the next guest, the next playable character. Hmm. What do you think the biggest hurdles are to Bitcoin scalability and Bitcoin transactability? Um, and do you think the solution for that comes from layer two technologies or something else? Love it. Love it. All right. Well, next time we will, uh, next week when we interview Eric, we will have that. We'll ask that to him. And uh, where can people find you? Where can people find everything? You just, you gave the Thea, but uh, you know, tell that again, where can people can find you all of the socials? 
yeah, so you can find me at Joe Consorti on X. I also have a YouTube channel, exact same name. Um, and you could find the app that we're building at Thea Bitcoin. Uh, you can go to Thea.us to learn more and app.thea.us to start uh, creating a simple and robust multi-sig vault. Once you use it, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's insanely simple. Um, in fact, the some of the feedback that I've gotten has been, it's so simple, I thought I did it wrong. Uh, I set it up <laughs> so quickly, I thought I did something wrong. So go check all of that out at Joe Consorti on X and Thea.us. Thank you, brother. I will link to all that as well and uh, put all that in the description for anyone who wants to check that out. Go do so. And uh, yeah, thank you, Joe, for being a playable character in a sea of non-playable characters. We need many more. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Brandon. If you like this interview, then you're going to love the one I just did with James Lavish, where we talk about everything Bitcoin and macro. Go check it out. Or you might love the one I just did with Brandon Quittum, where we talk about Bitcoin being a 500-year money. Come on, go check it out. You're going to love it. Come on. See you in there.